and Dempsey was ejected from the band to be replaced by Smith's longtime friend Simon Gallup. Keyboard player Matthew Hartley was asked to join the group, and in early 1980, the new four piece began recording their second studio album, 17 Seconds. Standout track A Forest earned high praise from the music press. Killing an Arab is, is the one that's been, from the start, has been a really famous song. But Boys Don't Cry is the first kind of hit, and that's the one that kind of crossed them over quite a lot. But for me, the one song that really defines The Cure for me personally is The Forest. It's just got everything that's great about The Cure. It's very sparse. It's, it's a very, it's, it sounds a bit like the first album. It's got a kind of weird kind of sound to it, and it's very, it's very, it's very poppy and melodic. But it also sounds like that quintessential kind of dark, moody Cure, that kind of, and it's got that kind of weird kind of dream, childlike dream kind of feel to it. It's a very, um, I say modern, but I mean late 70s kind of piece of psychedelia. It's kind of very post-punk psychedelic. It's a very black and white kind of sound to it. And it sounds like it come from any kind of period of their career, it would fit in any album. So to me, A Forest is definitely the uh, quintessential Cure track. I mean, for me, the big one that, that really changed my whole mind about The Cure was, was A Forest. And I, I just thought that was a, a wonderful um, combination of, of spooky guitars and, and, and a dream voice. And, and, and there, a formula seemed to be developing. I, 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 yeah, the, the, the voice, the guitar, and also an image that seemed very specific to Robert Smith and his mental state. You know, his mental state is always a key factor in, in a Cure song. Uh, the combination of, of quite ordinariness, really, down-to-earthness, and yet something very strange and bizarre and, and far-fetched. So he's, he's quite rooted in a, in a funny sort of way, but he's also completely you know, off his head. And I, I guess that was the moment when I, I first started to notice that, that, that that was an interesting tension. The Cure's first world tour followed the release of 17 Seconds, but was marred by further bust-ups, which culminated in Hartley leaving the group. Reformed as a three-piece, The Cure began work on their next album, Faith. The Cure have been through various different incarnations, so I think when you, when you look at the early stuff, they were, they were by no means a sort of ordinary band, but they were much more ordinary than they became. So songs like, you know, Boys Don't Cry, which is an absolutely classic, you know, Cure pop song, was this kind of wiry, minimalist punk thing, you know. It, they, if, I'd, if I'd got into them in 1979 and heard a song like that, I'm sure I'd have really liked it. But in a way, you wouldn't have thought there was a band that was going to go on to make, you know, ten albums and become one of the biggest bands in the world. They seemed like a quirky British thing, their, um, their early stuff. It was when they got into the real gloomy stuff, faith and pornography, that was when the band really started to sort of resonate with, with um, a wider fan base. By faith, which to me was, you know, when it started to become interesting, they, they, there was a seriousness about the way that they were using sound, you know, so they, they, they could obviously write these kind of very haunting and attractive pop songs and like a forest was so seductive. And it seemed to have that combination of, of being about sound, pure sound coming out of Eno and Bowie, but also the idea of the pop song uh, coming out of the, the more sort of stranger end of David Bowie. And I, I guess because Diamond, Bog, Diamond Dogs was almost an original example of what became known as the gothic sound, you know, Diamond Dogs was almost ground zero for that in a way, you know, along with the American band The Doors, you know, those were the two areas where it began. And so it was, it was when the, the Cure started to really kind of get that sense that they had their own identity coming out of something that was interesting. But, but it was, you know, a mix, you know, Bowie kind of jumped from one thing to the other. The Cure seemed to put it all in one place. So there were these, you know, gorgeous soundscapes and occasionally these, these ravishing pop songs. In the winter of 1982, The Cure embarked on a UK tour supported by Steve Severin of Susie and the Banshees. When the tour wrapped up in December, the band retreated to the Windmill Studio to rehearse some new material. It was during these brief sessions that new tensions began to flare up, with Gallup accusing Smith of wanting to leave The Cure to collaborate with Severin. A confused and distant Smith journeyed to London and stayed at Severin's house, where he wrote the bulk of the lyrics for pornography. Robert was in this sort of mid, this sort of limbo between not, sh not sure, he wasn't really sure whether he wanted the cure to continue or whether he wanted to go solo. So he was sort of mid 82. Um, and he just used to turn up on my, my doorstep, you know, Friday night with a crate of different sort of 
beverages and he'd sit there making cocktails and we'd, we'd talk and watch videos because I'd just got a video player. Him and Severin sort of became quite good buddies and had all sorts of, uh, you know, experiments with psychedelia music and I suppose took a lot of acid together and, uh, and, and, and kind of um, lived quite a, an extreme life and found, found, it, found connections with things they were interested in, I think. You know, the, the darker side of David Bowie, Robert Smith sort of mapped onto Severin's kind of um, appreciation of, of, of truly dark things in life and the Edgar Allan Poe and everything. And I suppose they, 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 they did find a way to fit into the same glove, which was kind of interesting. In early 1982, The Cure recruited producer Phil Thornley to begin recording pornography at Rack Studios in London. The album was released in May 1982 to tepid reviews, and the ensuing tour was a disaster. A fist fight between Smith and Gallup ended the bassist involvement with the band. Chris Parry tried to encourage Smith to take a new, more mainstream pop direction. Tolhurst moved on to Keys, and the band began recording upbeat singles such as Let's Go to Bed and The Walk, with session musicians on bass and drums. Smith, however, remained distracted and began to move closer to Severin, collaborating on a joint project, The Glove, as well as recording and touring with the Banshees. We got a lot of um, negative vibes, as we should say, from fiction, because they, they felt Robert was getting pulled in too many directions. I think I was seen as like, you know, this kind of elemental on his shoulder, whispering in his ear, telling him not to be the cure, and which wasn't the case at all. It was just that, you know, and I was there at one meeting with, with him and um, Chris Parry where he explained quite eloquently why he wanted to go and play with the Banshees for a second time, why he wanted to do the Glove album, just to get different experiences to add to the cure. And, um, but I think Chris was, um, was very nervous that he was going to go off and leave the cure behind and join the Banshees permanently. So there was this all, there was this tug, tug of war going on, um, <clears throat> which manifests itself more during the recording of the Banshees album Hyena in 84 that we did with Robert. The actual glove sessions were quite, they left us alone, you know, they, they never thought, you know, it was kind of like, oh, let the, let the two boys have their holiday and, you know, they'll come back to their senses eventually. In September 1983, The Glove released their only album, Blue Sunshine. The Glove got sort of mixed reviews. People to this day either love it or hate it. Um, but by that point, um, you know, the Banshees were suffering their first backlash. Um, so it kind, of, it kind of fell in the midst of that, and so it was seen as, you know, self-indulgent and, uh, you know, a waste of time. And, um, but we were quite open about it. We, 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 you know, we, we just said, yes, it's totally self-indulgent. That is the whole point of it. Smith had spent much of 1983 splitting his time between a pop project with The Cure and working with The Banshees. Towards the end of the year, his relationship with the Banshees started to become strained. By the time he was in the band for the second time, I was really, I really was that elemental on his shoulder. I was trying to convince him to leave the cure behind and to join the Banshees full time. Selfish reasons, of course, because, you know, number one, he was my friend, and number two, I wanted the Banshees to get some st stability. And I think, you know, I was definitely trying to squeeze Lowell out of the picture. I make no bones about that. But, you know, I respected his wishes, and that, you know, and kind of in the back of my mind, I knew he would never kind of give up the cure because he had too much of a personal vision to be subsumed in, into another band, particularly with such a strong front person as Susie. Even though, you know, he's been very conscientious and very determined and very neurotically needy of having the band, The Cure, I think for me it's always just been Robert Smith and this loose band of people that throw Cure-type shapes. You know, there's a, there's a certain way that a Cure member must look and, and, and hold his instrument and, and it gives the illusion for Robert who seems to need